Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm not sure there's much left to say at this point. Larry, you've covered it all. So, um, we actually, I am not the orator that Senator Campbell is, so I will be actually reading off my script, which might keep it a little more coherent for you than if I went ad lib. So I'm going to start out by thanking uh, the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences for inviting us to this debate, whereas it was presented to me an, ide an academic discussion on the topic of decriminalizing all drugs. It's timely, obviously, and an issue being discussed by, by most political leaders, as Senator Campbell referred to. That said, it's not one issue which we feel can be painted as either black or white. Indeed, if it were that simple, I think we would have wrapped this one up and put it in the can a long time ago. Um, and I'm especially pleased to be addressing an audience of professionals, medical professionals, researchers, and academics. Um, and I would ask that you look at this issue through a series of lenses, not least of which is a scientific one. We all have personal opinions on this, but it's vital that you consider this from a professional point of view. It's also important that you view this issue by identifying complex theories from false dichotomies and spurious conclusions from unfounded, unfounded causal attributions. And frankly, the world of drug policy is full of these and has been since time immemorial. And hopefully, my remarks don't fall in that category. So let's get to the topic of today, and that is whether the use of illicit drugs should be decriminalized. Along with Dr. Peter Budd, I will be presenting arguments against the proposition and what it means for us here in Canada. Uh, but I think it's first important that we be clear about what we mean by decriminalization. Uh, and we're going to stay on that topic for the purposes of our remarks as we've sort of built them out that way, but happy to discuss the different scenario that Senator Campbell introduced, which is the, the pure legalization of, of illicit substances. Um, and for the purposes of this debate, for, therefore, it means the removal of criminal sanctions associated with the possession of all drugs. And this uh, we took to be cannabis, cocaine, it could be crystal meth, of course. In addition, we would ask if it would presumably also include all currently controlled prescription narcotics, such as Oxycontin, fentanyl, and the like. So uh, I'll present five points that I think I'd like you to consider, and not so much to convince you, but as much as to get you to reflect on the types of questions you might want to ask yourself on the topic. The first is that the decriminalization of all drugs will not decrease the rate of illicit drug use in Canada. And I think actually Senator Campbell made a lot of the arguments I'll be making here, so apologies for the repetition. Uh, but I'm glad to see that he's already come onto our side. Uh, consider for a moment the issue of scale. That is, the percentage of Canadians engaging using substances in the past year. According to recent statistics, 9% of Canadians used cannabis in the past year. During the same period, less than 2% of Canadians used any other illicit drug. Now the percentage of Canadians who smoke, 17% and those who consume alcohol, 78%. According to the Cost of Substance Abuse in Canada report, which my organization issued a number of years ago, the cost of the two most prevalent legal drugs, alcohol and tobacco, cost almost four times that of illicit drugs. Uh, $14 billion per year annually for alcohol, 17 for tobacco, and 8.3 combined for all illicit drugs. And this relates to direct health care and enforcement costs and indirect costs related to lost productivity. The harm caused by our two most popular drugs, those being the legal ones, should be sufficient, I think, to give us pause before we suggest that all other drugs be decriminalized. Uh, they represent a real and serious threat and health threat, especially to our young people. I know that uh, Dr. Butt will speak about these a bit later. If you think about it for a moment, as a society, we cheer when we increase regulations on products that pose a risk to us. Asbestos is no longer allowed in our insulation, and we applaud knowing that BPA is no longer in our plastic, in our baby bottles. But today we're discussing whether we should decrease regulations by decriminalizing the use of drugs, which we know poses serious health risks. So I would ask, how do you square that one in terms of a societal approach? Finally, we would be concerned that removing criminal sanctions could increase prevalence, as we've seen in some jurisdictions, and we can of course quibble, and we will be quibbling on this, uh, where they have decriminalized drug possession. This could therefore increase the number of Canadians exposed to the harms associated with using drugs, drugs that today carry criminal sanctions, as a deterrent to use. So my second point is that the decriminalization of all drugs will not address all harms. And I think this is an important point. Um, I take the point that decriminalization would reduce the social harms associated with ha having a criminal record. That is very true. Uh, which can, and we know, limits mobility, access to fu certain future economic prospects. But would that reduction in social harm to an individual be sufficient to gain compared to our overall burden of harm, whether it be health, social, or economic. 
Put another way, how do we decide which harm trumps the other? Which one is more important and who decides? Is it always about economic harm trumping health harm or social harm? Most would agree that one harm cannot always trump another, and that would be unreasonable. What we, is most important are the principles we need to apply to weigh the relative cost of one harm over another. This is not a straightforward exercise, but one steeped in moral, philosophical, and legal views, and one for, worthy of further debate. I maintain that decriminalization is a very weak and ineffective means of addressing economic harm. There is no evidence to indicate that decriminalization will reduce rates of use. In fact, some data points the other way. Therefore, the case for reduced health and social service costs is hard to accept, particularly when conservative estimates place the direct cost of substance abuse to health care alone at over $8 billion. Further, as was pointed out earlier again, decriminalization would have a very limited effect on reducing enforcement resources since the substances in question would remain illegal. Also, because supply by definition is illegal, this requires an active black market of organized crime profiting from their trade. I'd also like to point out that it's rather false to claim that countries like the US and Canada must decriminalize drugs in order to reduce overall spending. Uh, the allocation of resources in any given country is a choice and a matter of prioritization. For instance, Sweden and New Zealand both have prohibition models and yet they invest much less in enforcement than we do in North America, and especially so when compared to the US. That being said, the recent edict from US Attorney General Eric Holder to the governors of Colorado and Washington State demonstrates this very point. That is, the US federal government has chosen to de-escalate its enforcement presence in those states which have recently decided to create a regulatory regime for legalized access to cannabis, a, position which this position, uh, a decision which this position does not support. But nonetheless, it does indicate that they can make a choice in terms of where they apply their dollars. Finally, as I mentioned before, decriminalization of all drugs will most likely increase health harms based solely on the prevalence of people who use these drugs and the negative effects they have on people. This underscores the need for ready access to prevention, treatment, and related resources for all affected. The argument that criminalization model denies us the ability to implement public health initiatives to reduce high-risk use is also not accurate because we do not need to take away the criminal sanctions to achieve some of our overall harm reduction goals, which brings me to my next point, that the decriminalization of all drugs is not required in order to, adop to adopt progressive, non-punitive approaches. We hear a number of common refrains. Uh, we need to address this issue, this issue from a public health perspective. We need to treat this issue as a health issue and not a criminal one, and we could not agree more. Uh, and consider these model of innovative health-based approaches to dealing with drugs, some of which uh, our panelists here were a part of in terms of initiating in Canada. Needle exchange programs, supervised injection sites, drug courts, wet shelters, which we have just up the road here, diversion programs, volumetric pricing for alcohol strength, and many more. All of these operate quite effectively within the current environment, despite some political buffeting on some of them. In fact, recently, it was alluded to, the Chiefs of Police of the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police formally called upon the government to add a ticketing option for simple cannabis possession while retaining the discretion of police to proceed with criminal charges when appropriate. The chiefs acknowledge that most possession cases need not go to court, but they also believe that it's important to maintain this discretion within a criminal justice environment. So as you can see, there are a number of effective means currently at our disposal that can address the social, economic, health harms without decriminalizing substances that at their very least are dangerous and at their worst are lethal. So my fourth point is that decriminalization will not erase the criminal element associated with the drug trade. As I stated earlier, decriminalizing drugs will not address the issue of supply, and the issue of supply necessarily involves this organized criminal operations. Uh, a decriminalized system for all, for all drugs sorry, maintains and arguably enhances a black market system. Even more alarming, by decriminalizing possession of these drugs that would remain illegal, it could be argued that the government of Canada is de facto supporting organized crime and the black market. With respect to law enforcement, I'd also take the opportunity to point out that a decriminalized model would require certain hefty increases in resources for police to address issues such as impaired driving. As it stands now, we are woefully under-resourced with police officers trained as drug recognition experts, and there are very limited means by which we can detect, uh, easily detect, and uh, deter drug-impaired driving. Finally, I would submit to you that we must consider that decriminalization removes a contact point, a point of contact with law enforcement that can be used to guide someone struggling with substance abuse into an appropriate treatment program. 
This cannot be understated if we are concerned on a larger scale with addressing the harms caused by substance abuse. Which brings me to my final argument. That is that the decriminalization of all drugs creates a confusing public policy environment where our citizens are unsure where we stand on this very important issue. Earlier this month, uh, the Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse uh, released a research report on how Canadian youth perceive cannabis. And I think in the whole discussion here, cannabis has its, its, is considerably an outlier and, and merits probably further discussion in other panels. As a parent of two Canadian youths, I, even I was a little surprised at the gap between fact and perception that was uh, uncovered in this report. Without delving into great detail, for that I encourage you to seek our report out at ccsa.ca, clearly the comms people wrote that part. Uh, what we observed is a profound lack of understanding of the effects of cannabis on the individual. Our focus group uncovered assumptions such as, cannabis helps you focus and can make you a better driver. It's natural, so it must be harmless. It treats mental health issues, it even cures cancer. And anybody who has teens in their house, uh, I'm sure you've had these discussions with uh, your, your children or your young adults, and they have become very adept at uh, arguing the position of this drug. But what this demonstrates is the need to develop and communicate clear, rational public policy. Uh, how we all talk to Canadians is important. How we have to make sure that people, especially youth, who are at higher risk of experiencing drug-related harm, don't think that if it's not criminal, then it must be okay. And this is the very real risk we run under a model of decriminalization. So let's recap. Imagine for a moment that you are the Minister of Health. And this decision, pick whatever political party you want. You're the Minister of Health. And this decision rests on your shoulders. You have the responsibility and accountability to the people of Canada to make the right call. We might all have our personal views, but to discharge that office and the obligations of that office appropriately. So what do you do? If you choose to decriminalize all drugs, it would be because you've made a conscious and informed decision to do so, much as you do in your everyday life uh, on, on an ongoing basis. You've examined the pros and cons and concluded that decriminalization is worth it because its purported benefits are acceptable, even though your decision will not decrease the prevalence of substances known to be addictive, harmful, or dangerous, and you accept that health, safety, and economic harms of drug use itself will be no better and likely, possibly, increase. You acknowledge the extreme limitations of decriminalization on the black market supply and turn a blind eye to your perce our perceived complicity. And finally, you are prepared to announce a new public policy that, with the exception of cannabis, an overwhelming majority of Canadians do not want, may not fully grasp, grasp its ramifications, both here and as it relates to Canada's place in the global community. If that is the outcome one wishes to create, then the decriminalization of all drugs would be a strategy worthy of pursuit indeed. However, I can't believe that anyone who uh, wishes to increase the health of their fellow citizens, to minimize the crushing load on our healthcare system, and to maximize the conditions in which our youth can grow, live and prosper, would even support a decriminalized system. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've tried to demonstrate there is no one silver bullet Apologies to Coors. No silver bullet to this complex and intractable social issue. Any solution must be based on the knowledge that there are a series of trade-offs required. Trade-offs that should reflect the priorities of a country's citizens. But I maintain there's tremendous latitude to exercise innovative, creative, and non-punitive approaches to reducing health and social impact of drug use within a system that may opt to criminalize possession of certain drugs in some instances. <clears throat> Actually, decriminalize all drugs would set in motion a movement that would be difficult, if not impossible, to change downstream. There is no need for revolution. Rather, evolution wa is warranted. Evolution based on decisions that balance complex issues with a view to securing the health and security of all, of all Canadians. Let us commit to exploring an appropriate balance within this range of options before we jump with both feet into an unproven social experiment. I thank you for your time and for inviting me to be part of this discussion today.